Welcome to our webinar, Unlock the Power of OnePlan, AI-Driven Insights and Seamless Integrations for Success. If you enjoy this topic, please explore our YouTube channel for more. Welcome, everybody. Um, we appreciate your time and attention today. Um, you know, the topic today really is about uh, the things that OnePlan addresses in the area of portfolio management with a focus on the power of integrations and the AI-driven insights that can come out of combined data source. So with that, let's get started. You know, traditional project portfolio management, which we've talked about in the past, has really gotten us, you know, advanced us to better things within our organizations over the years, over the last, you know, handful of decades. Um, and it really has gotten traditional benefits that we have see here. I won't go over these in more in detail, but, you know, better clarity and visibility, clearer objectives, you know, uh, more complete planning, you know, optimization of resources and allocations, um, you know, better visibility and reporting, et cetera. And there's quite honestly, a myriad of tools available that do basic project management, maybe simple portfolio management. And just some of them are just basic task management are out there. There's a, you know, just a plethora of tools that are out there, but the needs of the modern organization go way beyond this. For example, you know, there are a bunch of different execution methodology variations that people are using. Right? Agile continues to grow as we continue to try to be more responsive. But waterfall is still widely used in certain types of projects. And there's different variations or variants of Agile that are out there. Right? There's hybrid methodologies that combine both hybrid, you know, Agile and waterfall types of things. And then people tend to, uh, especially in their more immature days, cherry pick the versions and the aspects of certain versions that they want to use, let alone that, you know, with product development and other things that we're doing, continuous delivery is the rule of the day on the things that we're developing and delivering. So with that, it adds complexity where the traditional PPM waterfall only type of approach, uh, we've had to move on past that and do more things. You add on top of that, and I talked about the, the you know, the litany of tools that are out there in the marketplace today, the proliferation of tools across the organization breeds problems. For example, if I look at, say, for example, the different disciplines in PPM that we're working with, and this is just a subset of them, and then we kind of look at the different organizational units and departments that we have within our organizations, we can have all kinds of tools that are being used in different discipline uh, lanes, as well as different organizational units to do the same thing. Spreadsheets are still very common out there. People are using a variety of different planning tools. Some are using more agile planning tools, more waterfall planning tools, et cetera. Some are just using simple lists for things, et cetera. The idea of this proliferation of tools has a cost and a price to it. So one of them is that it breeds information silos and it breeds costs and inefficiencies for us. One thing it, you know, fosters is poor alignment and collaboration between the participating functional areas, like I highlighted in that last example. And then somehow we have to manually mash up data from multiple tools and data sources, and then manually create reports from all that um, in many cases. And then because of all those tools, we may be updating the exact same data in different tools to meet the needs of different audiences. And this is not only time consuming and wasteful, but it's also prone to error as we transcribe that information. And this, this Disconnected information, it, it becomes difficult to remain accurate and current across the board, let alone chasing team members down for timely and complete status updates that go into all these different tools. And then the other piece that is really important is this resource planning that we do oftentimes is done totally separately off to the side, commonly in spreadsheets that really isn't tied to the other parts of our planning. So then we get into the needs of moving into different types of portfolio management. Today, we're going to talk about adaptive portfolio management. Now, traditional project portfolio management that we see here in the green was definitely more waterfall and typical top-down governance-based types of approaches. And in this modern age of digital and business transformation, you know, many organizations are trying to transform to become more agile. And some strive to get all the way over to the left in this dark blue area where they try to do everything in an agile fashion with using uh, scaled agile types of approaches. And that's all well and good if it makes sense for all the work that you're doing within the organization or if the organization can get there, period. Either way, it's a long journey. That transformation journey can typically take years. And in the interim, this adaptive piece where you're using a mix of things, mix of methodologies, mix of tools, et cetera, like that, 
maybe where you're at for that multi-year transformation period on the, in the interim, but the analysts are finding that most organizations find and settle into some type of an adaptive mode ongoing. And while they do as much as they can agile, that adaptive piece seems to be the rule of the day out there. And that bears, um, bears out with the conversations we have with our customers these days. Now, the elements of adaptive is really that transparency and insights for better and faster decisions across all that work, no matter what the methodology or the tools. Being able to have that visibility to make quick adjustments to changing needs and priorities. Be able to balance those investments and resources to, uh, to optimize business value and return. Support teams that use a variety of execution tools and methods like we just talked about. And then automate the consolidation of information from a variety of data sources. And we're gonna talk about that specifically today. Ultimately, what we want is a single source of truth. Now, this is all great within one context of data, but we could also have multiple portfolios in an organization. For example, we might have our traditional project portfolio in a PMO. There might be a professional services portfolio for our services armor of our organization. There might be an IT service portfolio or product or product development portfolio, application, application development portfolio. The idea is it can get complex and splintered if we don't harness it and bring it together. One plan, our goal and what we've designed this to do is to let teams to execute how they need to. For example, in this case, I have different methodologies, iterative waterfall, for example, as I'm depicting here. Different tools might be being used by different constituencies in our organization, and those are folding up into then uh, different programs, and those programs are maybe within portfolios, and then we have to align them with maybe different strategies and objectives that the organization has for better strategic alignment. The key there is, is to be able to give the teams what they need that's conducive for the type of work that they have, but give leadership the visibility they need for decision making and tracking how their investments are doing. And this doesn't change even if we're doing all agile in an organization we might be using different tool sets for example some people may be using azure devops some people using jira some people use one plan itself for this type of thing but the idea there is is that the teams might be doing more agile methodology and approaches and metrics on uh, how they're doing with burn ups burn down velocity etc but leadership may still want to see the language of the business or more financial types of things the more uh, business type metrics as opposed to more the agile metrics and one plan is designed to uh, serve the needs of these different constituencies. Now, so one plan gives you the power to choose. If you look at this diagram that just depicts in a simplistic format, you know, at the top is a hub where all this information coalesces uh, into combined portfolio management and all the details that are required. And the source of that could come from one plan because one plan has its own planning tools. You don't need other tool sets, but the reality is you may have other constituencies in your organization um, different user bases that are already committed and have a lot of thought process invested in other tools. So for example, here, this portfolio could be made up of data that's coming from Smartsheet, Microsoft's project for the web, the uh, project professional on the desktop or Azure DevOps. We even add things like monday.com, for example, and um, Microsoft has recently rebranded project for the web into planner premium to be part of the planner family, essentially the same tool set, but rebranded. And then the idea here is to have a comprehensive set of portfolio management capabilities that accesses and leverages this, not rip these tools out of people's hands as a price for getting good portfolio management. Let's not fight that battle. Let's leverage what's already there. Now, to do that, you know, it was messy in the old days where we'd, you know, be coding one-off integrations for all these different tool sets that we have. Now, one plan has an integration platform called OneConnect that has a, you know, a variety of different out-of-the-box connectors, uh, for example, on the work management and project management tools. There's a whole slew of them are the more popular ones that are available. More agile and software development tools that are out there. You know, your financial system, which is a key to getting financial data to and from at times, or CRM systems that feed into your professional services, et cetera. The key is, is to be able to have this done seamlessly, as it said in the title of our webinar today, to be able to do that as routine and have that done without the user having to intervene. Now, what this does is help us bring together that enterprise-wide and cross-functional efforts across those different departments that we showed with all those different tools that they're using. And it's not limited just to our project management office, right, or our PMO. Uh, everyone has their own individual projects that they work on within their own individual areas. But then in this age of digital and business transformation, 
there are many high impact cross-functional efforts that we have to coordinate across all this. So we need tool sets and visibility to make that happen effectively. The other part of integration is not just the data piece. How about the user experience that people have, right? We also have a fused UI experience that stays working in the tools that keeps users uh, working in the tools they work in every day. For example, you know, one plan can be just using your favorite browser. End of story, right? Well, let's just say you've committed as an organization to Microsoft Power Apps, its low code, no code platform for solutions. Well, we can consume and leverage one plan from within your Power App, okay? And we actually developed a, a Power App accelerator for PPM for Microsoft that one plan plugs into very nicely. Microsoft Teams, we're an authorized Microsoft Teams application. So if you wanna consume and use um, OnePlan in Teams, you can do that within specific Teams or channels and uh, also use it for your content and collaboration in addition to what you're doing in OnePlan. The same holds true with Azure DevOps. You can actually use the OnePlan capabilities while you're working in Azure DevOps without having to leave. Once again, uh, minimizing task switching by your users. And the same holds true for Dynamics, uh, SharePoint, and also in things like JIRA now, from a non-Microsoft perspective. So once again, efficiencies by minimizing task switching and working in the environment that you're usually in. Now let's layer onto that all adaptive piece of bringing in all these disparate tools and methodologies together. And really the modern need here is to make sure with limited resources and funding that we have these days is to make sure we're working on the right things. And in this age, we want to connect the shared objectives of our business strategists or our leaders and those executing the change to make sure the things that we're working on are helping drive the results or uh, fulfill on the strategies that our leaders are taking us to in our organizations. And this involves not just the system, it's the people and how they work, it's the strategy itself, and it's operationally how we execute on that. And it's really an overall system of developing that strategy planning and aligning our organizations around that strategy, our operational plans and our project plans, putting those in place so that they're consistent with what the strategy is. And then as we monitor and learn through execution, you know, we can, you know, learn, get better and adapt and form the basis for increased value by executing the strategy well and getting the most return out of our efforts. Now, strategic portfolio management, strategic alignment is important today because things have gotten more complex. There's more risks, there's more changes, and we have to make sure that we're doing the right thing so that we deliver at the end of the day with the market, what our customers want, et cetera, and what's best for our business. There's a greater need for financial and resource optimization because of the scarcity of resources. We have to maximize and allocate our resources and finite resources on the things that make the most sense. And then demand for data-driven decision-making. If we have that fragmented silos of data, we can't get good demand, uh, uh, excuse me, good data-driven decision-making out of that. Bringing that all together is paramount to get information at our fingertips to make those decisions, get insights into portfolio performance and make uh, decisions that help us achieve our uh, strategic goals. We talked about, you know, the agile methodologies and other tools around that. We have to incorporate this diversity of execution and tool sets if we want to be effective and not reach barriers of adoption in our organization because we uh, we want to get somebody into one monolithic tool. And then the emerging technologies and business models. You know, in this age of digital and business transformation, there are new ways to reach our customers. There are new challenges of all those things. There are disruptors out there. And we have to figure out how to incorporate those things and become effective at reacting to those and actually capitalizing on those things to our advantage. So the, really the idea of strategy execution and alignment is to really build a strategic plan. In this case, we're talking about the, the modern way, the common way people are doing things with objectives and key results or OKRs. And then have an execution set of things, whether it be portfolios, resources, financials, schedules, work, et cetera. The idea is to align those things so that they're working in concert and they're um, supporting one another. So if we think about an objective that we have in an organization like growing revenue and the tangible key results that might uh, be associated with measuring our tangible progress towards meeting that, there may be different efforts that we have. For example, we might have to update an overall business capability we have like order processing or specific applications themselves that have to be updated or upgraded or revamped in order to support the new process. And then there's the projects and initiatives themselves. These things are all interrelated. And if we don't have that type of strategic alignment in our organization, 
we may miss the boat on delivering successfully if we don't factor in all the things that are required. Resource capacity we talked about is key. If you don't have a good method for resource capacity that is aligned with the overall plan, the overall portfolio, and the strategies themselves, we may complete, completely miss the boat and waste uh, scarce resources that we have on the wrong things. One plan we're going to talk about provides resource planning, negotiation of resources and matrix organizations, tracking for managers and teams looking for more visibility and transparency into what's required and where those over allocations are and where trade-offs need to be made. And then resource prioritization and modeling, be able to have what-if scenario modeling so that as these changes keep hitting us, right, in this very um, um, dynamic age, um, the ability to assess in a scenario model what the impacts are, what our choices are, what our best course of action might be from both a resource and a financial perspective. Now, resource management you know, also has to happen in a variety of ways. Um, Top-down resource management is more high-level, more of a high-level capacity plan can often be done before you even have a schedule on a project, for example. And this may be needed just to justify the project early on. So it's high-level information and think about it as more like commitments. It's you know high-level, early-stage planning. It's the easiest method to get started and maintain because it's not at a detailed task level. And some organizations do only top-down planning and stay here and are very effective doing that. But then some organizations, when they actually start building schedules, if they resource load them and have assignments of individual resources on those things, it's a roll-up of those things that indicate how we're intending in detail to use those resources and it may differ from that original top-down plan. It, this requires more rigor and consistency uh, across the board in an organization but for example you may do this in a phased approach and resource management and the discipline that you need around that can be accommodated in one plan uh, with one or both of these methods that you might want to put into place. So one plan if you think about it when I talk about all the things needed in a modern age the OKRs and the strategic plans are in there. Uh, some light enterprise architecture to have those elements that we might want to align with, like business capabilities and applications. The ideation and request area. Uh, as changes come in, all kinds of requests and ideas come in. We have to vet them, you know, prioritize them and select them. So ultimately, we can put together a portfolio of things that we're going to work on that are the right things to work on. And we might look at it from a variety of different types of views. Now, the resource capacity planning, for us to say yes to something blindly when we don't have the resources to really fulfill on it is really setting ourselves up for failure. So we have to balance what we uh, take on with our ability to deliver on those resources and deliver in a quality fashion. Same thing holds true with our budget and our finances. And the what if scenario modeling, be able to evaluate alternatives without impacting the current production source data is very paramount to understanding where we want to go and be able to look at alternatives and react quickly. And then once we decide on what we're going to work on, the execution of those things from whether waterfall work plans in one plan or agile work plans in one plan, they can be done directly in one plan. We don't need other tool sets, but the reality is we know that other people are going to want to use other tools because they're already committed in some way. And the connectors we talked about are all available to feed into those, including things like issues, risks, changes, lessons learned, et cetera, things that we might want to track. And then the resource planning on an individual project level and the resource negotiation that might have to happen in matrixed organizations uh, happens right here in one plan and all feeds into that overall resource capacity plan we talked about earlier on. And let's not forget about the team members. You know, the feedback from them on how we're doing on these things, the people closest to the work, to give them a, a tool set where everything that they're working on can come into a central hub of their my work to provide status and visibility for them. And the ability to do a timesheet right there if the organization requires that is important. And then ultimately having a rich data set from all these different tools rolled up in all these different dimensions in portfolio management gives us the ability to have good uh, reporting across all this. And that includes the status reports for individual projects, and that includes for dashboards at a variety of different levels and visualizing how all these things interrelate. Ultimately, we want to have the right outputs and the right deliveries uh, and the right outcomes for our projects. Now, another key aspect of what we're going to talk about today is AI. And one plan has been very early. Our, our, uh, our URL has, from the very beginning, been oneplan.ai. AI, our vision has been to go in this area long before the, uh, the chat GPT hype hit. 
And we now have a um, AI assistant called Sophia that is going to help us get even better at working on these things that you see up above. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. The key is to do the right work, select the right things to do, and then do it well, to do the work right and deliver in a quality fashion. Now, for the AI piece, we're now in this age where an inbuilt AI assistant and one plan has Sophia for that. Uh, the exciting part about this is we're already working on the next phase of the future, which is more uh, fully autonomous uh, SPM, where it diagnoses certain things and brings certain things to our attention um, proactively without us having to ask it with prompts and things like that, be able to do analysis and things like that to bring things to our attention for decision support and be able to help us do things uh, in a way that uh, it brings to us rather than us bringing questions to it. So the idea there is that's coming very, very soon. And so Sophia, just so you know, it's part of the core one plan product. It's not a premium add-on. And it's based on Microsoft's Azure Open AI model, which it you know has uh, exclusive exclusivity with uh, with Open AI. And because it's in the Microsoft Cloud, it provides additional compliance and security and uh, uh, protections that you may not get with the general Open AI, Open Internet things that are out there, including protection of your data and other things like that. And One Plan actually uses that and its own learnings with additional things we've trained it about the SP uh, strategic portfolio management discipline, as well as allowing it to leverage in real time the one plan data that's on your screen without um, uh, it learning that data. It actually can leverage that and factor it into its responses to your prompts. Now, Sophia is always available in one plan, so you don't have to worry about going to a specific place for that. Wherever you're at in the tool set, you can uh, leverage Sophia and, uh, uh, and ask it uh, for certain things. And we give you some ideas of some things in a particular context of where you're at in the tool, what might be applicable, but you can ask it anything either through typing it in or uh, using the microphone. Now, what kind of things can you do in strategic portfolio management? Well, there's augmented data entry, helping you with data entry things that you might need to do. Automated information retrieval. There's communication automation, basically sending things out to stakeholders and your bosses and other folks like that, status reports and other communications, uh, helping with resource estimation and optimization, uh, helping identify and assess underperforming investments that require our attention, uh, help with forecast completion and spending analysis and budget planning and optimization of those plans, identifying risks for the types of projects that you're working on so that you can proactively at least log them and keep uh, a monitor of them uh, as you move forward. Defect reduction as well as finding data anomalies. So these are just some of the things that you might find as in use cases for that. And the Gardner Group took a look and did a study, and they talked about you know, what we're looking at as far as time savings per project moving forward that we can anticipate. And we look at these different areas like schedule creation and management, you know, where a weekly time is assessed of uh, typical of three hours a week could be um, reduced to 30 minutes a week for a time savings of two to two hours and 30 minutes. All these different areas are not about removing um, uh, the roles that we have, but it's changing the roles we have. It's taking some of the more mundane administrative things, making us more efficient at getting those things done and freeing us up for more high value activities in our organizations. If we're a project management organization, free us up more for uh, mentoring, optimization and maturing the organization uh, and those types of things uh, in the organization and really providing more value from what we do as opposed to um, um, the more the more uh, administrative types of things. So with that, I thought I'd show you a little bit of a demonstration of that in one plan uh, moving forward. So for example, I talked about the um, the individual user, and I'll just start here briefly and just say that you know all the different capabilities you have in one plan are off to the side here in the left hand navigation that you might want to look at, and we'll go through those as we as as we go through the demonstration. But for example, Daniel Williams here, if he comes here as an individual user, he may have insights that you've set up to re, you know, let him uh, see what requires his attention on things that are overdue or out of compliance or needs approval and those types of things and have that come right to him. You know, recent conversations on the things that he's involved in, the plans, the resources, the tasks that he's involved in, what might be coming up due soon, and then access to the specific things that he's uh, involved in. 
So he doesn't have to go through an entire large portfolio of projects to get the things that matter to him. To be able to get to those things, create items in here, whether or not he has to log an issue or a risk or a new idea or create a new project, or even get to a specific area of a plan, like the work plan or the resource plan or the financial plan, et cetera. All can be done right from this user's homepage, which is very cool. Projects typically start as somebody's idea or somebody's request. And we didn't talk about that too specifically other than in the overview piece. But for example, you know, an idea place is a, is a, a portal in one plan where anybody in the organization can come and log an idea. And the people who are responsible for approvals on those things now have a place to vet all those things. We don't have some segmented set of emails or spreadsheets or all kinds of things that we have to coalesce around, right? The idea here is that we come through and we can actually create new ideas. And by looking at one that's been created, you can set up a form of the data elements that you'd like to capture, like how you categorize this request, right? And the metadata around that, the business case narrative that you may want to put in there in rich text, the ability to have maybe financial and uh, budget and benefits estimates, and maybe a prioritization scheme that calculates a prioritization score for common valuation of those types of things. And maybe association with other things like strategic plans or other plans that it might be dependent on as we go through that. The key there is, is that as we go through um, this process, we can typically in typical organizations come up with many more ideas or requests than we could possibly fulfill it, right? And we go through an approval process and at some point we may come in here and say, let's reorganize this. And reorganize would allow us to take this idea or request and promote it into a project, taking with it all the data that we captured with it without having to recreate or transcribe that type of information. Um, so the key here is, is that you, know, you may have voting for more crowdsourcing, you may have a prioritization mechanism, you may have some vetting. And the key here is, is that you can then make better informed decisions on what you should be promoting into your projects and initiatives. So for example, if I wanted to leverage Sophia here, in the area of ideas or requests, I could ask it a question like, based on priority, votes, and ROI, what three projects should we approve first and why? And let's see what um, what, what Sophia may uh, come up with for us. So it will assess, or she will assess, all the different aspects that we've already input into these ideas and requests. And basically it's saying the first three projects that we should do are the website redesign, it's high priority, it's got the, a good number of votes, and it's been given the green light, and it's uh, uh, got some immediacy, immediacy, et cetera. So it's given me the rationale for why we should actually do these things, and, and, and it's basically given me three projects or three requests that we should promote into projects. Once again, we put our own slant on those things, but help us in our analysis of those types. Let's just say we go through that process, and we are come to a portfolio of initiatives that we want to work on. So I'm going to go to the My Portfolio area within one plan, right? And we can structure this any way that you want. We have some templates for some common ways people do that. But we use what's called a plan type and a plan type hierarchy. In this case, I've got a plan type hierarchy where I have one or more portfolios. Here I've got eight portfolios. And then within those, we've got programs. And then within the programs, there's projects and epics, which actually have uh, denotes really a waterfall project versus a more agile project. We've even broken the epic down one more layer further down to feature level if we want to do things like program increment planning and things like that. But the, uh, the idea here is you can structure this in this plan type hierarchy any way that you see fit. Now, if I expand one of these portfolios and the programs within it, you'll notice there's a bunch of projects and epics within that program. And I'll call your attention to the icons to the left-hand side here. And this is where we get into this adaptive multiple set of connected tools, right? For example, I've got a bunch of plans that are connected to Microsoft Teams for content and collaboration. But for example, this one here is actually connected to Teams for content and collaboration, but it's also connected directly to Azure DevOps for details on its backlog and or its schedule, right? This one particular is, is uh, connected to Microsoft Project for the Web, and this one's connected to Microsoft Project Professional. This one's connected to Monday.com. This one's connected to Smartsheet. So the key there is, is that you have the flexibility to have a holistic portfolio, but have the detailed plans coming from uh, and completely integrated, seamlessly integrated with those other popular tool sets and bringing those into your common portfolio. Now, yes, we can look at views like this that are more KPI oriented, 
we might have views in here that might allow us to do some things with trending. So we snapshot data such that you can look at trending and how things are trending over time. So if I look at this same portfolio of information and look at the trends, I can look at how we're doing on the state of the project and the status trend and how we're doing on budget and active issues, et cetera, and keep an eye on that, whether we're trending well or trending badly uh, in those regards. Um, we could also you know, come in here and just strip out that primary plan type hierarchy and look at what we call a summary view in this particular case, but it's a flat view of all the projects and epics that are in here, right? When we when we look at that. And what this gives us the opportunity is to look at this and summarize it, group it, filter it by something other than that primary hierarchy. So for example, I could come in here and say, let me look at this by business unit. And now uh, I can take a look here and if I wanna understand what's going on in our uh, transformation program, I can see the projects that are doing on the transformation program. It looks like we're doing well. Everything looks green in transformation. I can see the summarizations of dollars and budgets and those types of things. And we can filter by those same parameters if you want to isolate that data rather than group it. You know, if we have different categorization or metadata we do around the project by category. Now I can look at this by, you know, here's the compliance projects that we're working on and how we're doing on those. You know, if I want to look at ownership a little bit and I want to see, you know, who the manager is and the project manager on these, and I can look at you know, a specific set of projects by Bertram that he's working on and how Bertram's projects are doing, as well as maybe isolate this stuff by things like executive sponsor. Once again, we brought this together, regardless of what execution tools are being used, right? And bringing them into one common hub so we can do this dynamic type of analysis. We also have board views. So for example, if I go into the boards, and look at this particular case, this one I've got the columns are by the state of the project proposed, active, closed, or on hold. Uh, there's no swim lanes on this, but I can also see that market research, I've got the high level data that we chose to show on the card, but at any given point in time, I can go look at or drill into the details around that card and look at why market research might be read. So for example, as I look at the details on, on the pop out on the quick edit here, and I look at the status, I can see it's because the schedule's off track. It looks like we're doing okay on resource utilization and on finance, financials and on issues. It's really the schedule is what makes us off track is because we're behind. So once again, we can look at this in a variety of different ways. So for example, if I come in here and look at this board by, let's just say by goals and by program, we could actually interject swim lanes on top of those columns. In this particular case, I can see the, the grow the business. I've got a yellow one here on the app project, or I got to run the business user interface enhancements, et cetera. And these are agile development, asset replacement, and other different uh, programs that we have that we're aligning those things by. Okay, so we can flexibly change our boards and have a variety of different board views that we want. We also have the roadmaps. And those roadmaps give us the ability to look at a more roadmap type of view. In this case, I've got the swim lanes by uh, the business unit and how those are doing. And once again, from any of these views, since they're live data, I can come in here and actually look at why this is yellow and basically bring up the details around that at any given point in time uh, while I'm looking at this graphical view, as opposed to some folks are still dealing with static roadmaps that aren't dynamically tied to the real data. You know, in the, you know, list views, you know, we can have a, diff a lot of different perspectives on this, right? So for example, if I went from this, you know, portfolio summary view and I went to go into say a, um, uh, well, let me just, I'll just stay here. And, you know, we could have, we could have a prior prioritization view or other things that we were working on. Um, I could come in here and ask Sophia in this question. I might say to her, which project based on the data that it sees here needs the most corrective action and why? And basically take a look at that and see what she comes up with as a response for us. Once again, this is real time information, leveraging what it knows in general from its language model what it knows from what we've trained it on this discipline. And it says that social media strategy is, be, is, is its choice because one, it's off track and it's off track in a number of different dimensions. It's off schedule and it, um, uh, it's budget against the benefit, excess success, excessive costs and reduced benefit, which is generally not a good indicator. So once again, it's given me not only its choice, but it's given me the rationale around that as we go through. So just a couple of examples there. Now, if I drill into a specific project, there's all kinds of different dimensions in here. For example, you can structure, and we have templates for this to get you started, but 
But the idea here is the details page would give you the ability to identify phase or gates or stages for your projects. The metadata that you want to capture around those projects so we can categorize in those views and reports, et cetera. The business case data that may have come over from the initial request or idea in the first place, so we have a record of that. The prioritization values that drove the prioritization score that's here. We even have the associations that might be associated, have this with the strategic elements like the uh, key results or applications it's uh, associated with or products or value streams that it might be associated with, as well as current data on things like where we're at in schedule, the financials, the project effort, project health, project status. And once again, you know, it's comprehensive on all these different dimensions in one place. You know, the work plan here, in this particular case, it came from um, um, one plan itself. It was built right in one plan. This one is not connected to any additional tool set right here on this particular backlog or on the schedule work type. As you can notice here, we have different work types, the schedules for more waterfall planning, the backlogs for more agile planning. You can even log things like risks, issues, changes, and maybe key decisions that are made along the way. And you can even add your own work types in here, like things like lessons learned or assumptions and that type of thing that people often put in these types of things. But the idea is you have a choice to connect this to any different work plan tool that you've enabled uh, the connector for within one plan. So while this one was built directly in one plan, you can use this any way you like. Um, you know, if I come through here and I go into our templates, you can, you know, basically use a rich templating capability to basically say, you know, uh, here's organization-wide templates that we want people to use for consistency, personal templates that people might want to add in their library, maybe certain online templates that are available to you. You can import things from other one plan plans or from CSVs that are exported from other tools. And you can also use AI to ask it to create a plan for you based upon what it knows and the data that you give it on the question and actually apply it right here within one plan. So once again, AI assistance, but once again, bringing everything together into a common hub. On top of that, we've got the resource capacity planning we talked about in the slides. You know, you can have a top-down plan here of the resources that are required. Uh, I can look at it in terms of hours or maybe full-time equivalents that we want to look at as we go through that and build that plan. Um, we can look at the financial plan in whatever detail cost categories that you want to. The labor cost can be coming over right from the resource plan itself and the rates that are available to us. And we can compare things like forecast with budget and budget with actuals and be able to manage that right within here as well, let alone the reporting. One of the key benefits that people get out of this is that you know, status reporting each reporting period becomes a very manual exercise. We can fashion a report format that actually pulls in dynamically the data that you need for your reports, gives you areas that you can actually put narrative status in here as you see fit, pull in associated items like, hey, tasks that are in progress or active issues that we're dealing with or risks, et cetera, and then have it automatically create this for you at any given point in time. And that when you submit it and approve it, it will actually snapshot and capture that data over different periods of time so that you can do the things like the trending. And for non-one plan users who could look at it right in here, but you could actually put it out for external folks on things like PDFs or words or email it in the body of a report so that you can bring that stuff out right from something that's more of a natural output rather than a creation of a project in and of itself each time you do these status reports, okay? Um, you know, if I go back, to the portfolio and I drill into a project here, for example, let me look at the you know, IT Azure DevOps plan, okay? And this one is connected to Azure DevOps where it's getting its work plan details from, okay? So if I go into the work plan here and IT Azure DevOps and I go into the backlog work type here and let me just expand that so you can see I got features and user stories and you can see the icons seeing here that these are all connected to Azure DevOps, and they're all coming from Azure DevOps. And I can also see now from an integration perspective that I got an active live connection to Azure DevOps. And if I have rights to go to Azure DevOps, I can just open that right over here in Azure DevOps, right from one plan uh, if I want to. I was seeing a reflection of the data that's coming from Azure DevOps in one plan. Here is the epic that it's tied to and the child pieces that are in here, which is basically the features below which the user stories are there, et cetera. One of the cool things in here is not only is it tied directly to this, right? 
we have access to the one plan capabilities here. Like for example, you can get to the portfolio in one plan. You can get to the my work in one plan. You could get to the resource plan in one plan. And I can open the things that are specific to this epic from one plan and actually work with that stuff right here in Azure DevOps that you typically wouldn't have access to in Azure DevOps. So for example, here's the work plan. And I could also have not only an agile backlog, but I could also have a schedule on a release plan and things like that that I want with that. I can have the resource plan made available to me right here within Azure DevOps, the financials and the detail page, et cetera, all available to me right from within Azure DevOps. So once again, connection uh, of the data, but also a fused UI for an enhanced user experience. Now, I could very quickly, easily, without going back to the portfolio, switch to other plans. So for example here, if I go to here and I go to say some of my favorites, and I say, well, what if I want to, you know, uh, go from this and show maybe Microsoft's project for the web, which is now Planner Premium. Uh, the idea here is that I can go look at, say, the schedule that's here. And the schedule, though simple as it is, is actually coming from a connection that we have with Microsoft Project for the Web. And same thing like we did with Azure DevOps, we're going to go over there and it's, you're going to see the source data that's automatically synchronizing uh, here with Project for the Web. So once again, you can use Project for the Web if that's where your planning data is. We can connect it to one plan and pull it into a portfolio item within one plan for that purpose. Now, you don't have to do anything once that connection is set up. It will periodically, typically hourly, update that plan without the user having to do anything. But if you have a demand for a report or something like that, you could, you know, on demand, import the data one off if you need to. But by no means is that required. If I go to switch to another plan, um, let me switch to, uh, in this case, let me switch to, uh, let me go to Smartsheet. So there's one with a Smartsheet connector that's in here, right? And here is a plan that was built that came fully from our planning that was done in Smartsheet. And the integration I have here is an active connection with Smartsheet. And if I go to open that item, the user that is working in Smartsheet is continuing to do their work in Smartsheet, but one plan is periodically pulling that data over so that it rolls up into our overall portfolio of information. So here's my Smartsheet instance, and here is the schedule, the source that's coming from in here and the structure that you see in here, which is exactly what you see over here as far as the structure within one plan. So for example, everything in one plan will show the same way, regardless of the source, right? But it's leveraging that data dynamically. And I guess I'll do um, just a couple more just to, show that those connectors are here. Uh, you know, one is, let's look at monday.com. Same type of concept where I've got a schedule. I've got it broken out. There's two phases that are built out right now, scope and design. And if I look at the integration and the connection that's there to monday.com, it's gonna take me to Monday. And the plan that's there is the source of what is being pulled into one plan for part of a holistic uh, uh, portfolio that's in there regardless of where the source of the execution data. So here is the, the, uh, the monday.com data that, that it's coming from, okay? And I guess the only other piece I guess I would show now, because JIRA works the, pretty much the same way as Azure DevOps does, but if I go to switch the plan here and I look at Microsoft Project on the desktop, which many people are still using. So the new stuff that Microsoft's working with is really pretty much working only with Project for the Web, which is now called Planner Premium. But there's a lot of folks that have, complex projects that require the tool sets of project professional on the desktop. And many people have a lot of things invested in that particular plan. So if I go to project professional plan here and I go to the work plan, you'll see I've got a detail plan here and you can see what I've got integrated here. And because this is a desktop tool and not a web tool, right? If I go to open this item, it's actually connected to um, um, Microsoft project on the desktop. And a little bit different here, in this case, I'm working with a standalone Microsoft Project Plan. It could be Microsoft Project Online. But the key here is, is that this source plan is where that data in one plan is coming from. And what one plan does, it provides for this, it provides a connector tool within Microsoft Project that allows us to publish this plan out to um, Microsoft, receive updates back from the updates that come in there, and map the resources, et cetera, over there. 
So basically what we're looking at is a plan that's once again, based from a desktop tool here that comes over there from um, um, all these different tool sets. Now we talked about the individual resource plans within the projects and I showed you that for individual projects, that, but the power is really how it all aggregates up. And if I aggregate this up to an overall resource plan, and I look at resource plans, and I can look at them by individual resources, or in this case, I got them aggregated by role. If I look in here and look at developer uh, resources and the individuals that are in there, as well as what may be assigned generically uh, by, to an individual generic developer, I can see where, and let me just take a look and switch this over to an FTE view. I can see at some point, I need more than nine or 10 or 12, where I only have a capacity of seven. So once again, if I have this visibility ongoing, I'm unlikely to um, uh, over allocate it to this degree uh, uh, ongoing. But as I need to reallocate some of these things, I may want to look for candidates to get a named individual onto this concept development. And I can have the tool find me best matches that tell me who might be unavailable or available, where it says here, right here, it looks like a Steve McGarrett might be a candidate because he has full availability at the time frame that I'm looking to get a resource on there and I can replace that resource right here uh, in that view. Um, I can also um, look at, and this is more of a top-down plan that we talked about in the slides. On the bottom-up plan, we might be looking at what's scheduled and then coming in from the tasks within our detailed tactical plans. And as I go through that and I look at you know, the schedule and I go down by role and I look into say Jared Dunn, I can see he's on these projects, right? And I can see the one he's most allocated on, and I can see because he's on all these tasks within that detail plan, right? I could also look at it uh, from a timesheet basis. If you're collecting actuals, for example, you can look at what the actuals are that are coming in from all these different resources. As I come through here and I look at um, um, a timesheet, say for example, and I drill into uh, say the engineering, I drill into Daniel Williams, I could actually do a compare and let me compare, say, for example, what was scheduled to what's been charged time-wise on these tasks, right? And as I go look at that, I can see, for example, here in June that I'm red because I was supposed to be about quarter time on this in June, and I ended up being about 50% of the time in, the, in the, uh, uh, the hours that were actually charged. So once again, good resource capacity planning and visibility on that. Um, overall, the strategic alignment pieces are really all about First, developing a strategy, and I'll go to the strategic plan first and talk about it in a, in a very high level right now. And that high level would be to set up your objectives and your key results. In this case, I got to improve IT infrastructure and some um, uh, key results that are tangible measures. And I can drill in and I can have forms just like we had on the projects where we um, look at what the objective description are, what the measures, what the progress is, uh, when the time frames are we want and what key results it's aligned with, right? And if I come into this type of thing and I go back to this and I go say, let me just look at what we call the visualizer. And the visualizer basically will say what things are dependent on us and we have a successor that's dependent on us, but the real key is the associations here on the runway. And the idea here is, is that we have an objective that has three key results that has projects and epics that are aligned with those. And there's other elements like products and applications and business capabilities that are also associated that we have to factor in, as well as color coding by the status. And for example, if I wanna look at why this is red, I could drill in and do that kind of quick edit dynamically from here and keep status updates based upon the things that I'm relying on or I'm associated with to make sure that things I'm depending on aren't falling out of bed. So once again, these are all things that align with as part of this overall adaptive and strategic alignment approach. Now, I won't have much time here today to go into details around this, but the what if analysis is key. And I can build models with prospective projects and ideas that we have um, that uh, we can assess. For example, there's 43 things here I would like to do. And I might have constraints on here because I don't have the dollars or the resources to do this, right? So I can see here that the resources got a lot of red on it, probably not doable. The financials um, are, are something that um, I have some red in the financial aspects of it as well. And if I go look at 
different scenarios that I create where I select and deselect projects or move them out in time, I can basically assess what I can do within, say, a $10 million budget and look at the types of things that we have in here and basically say, out of that 43, for $10 million, I can only find 17 prioritized projects that I could actually do for that $10 million, right? Um, and But I do have a scenario that fits within that $10 million threshold. And I can do another series. I have a $15 million scenario, et cetera. And the idea here is that I can compare uh, different scenarios and have metrics in here like the budget and the benefits that we have. And say, for example, the difference between the 10 and the five is a spend of 5 million. But if I can find the 5 million, I'm anticipating I could generate another $20 million in benefit. It might be worth my time to explore being able to do that. So the key here is that you have all types of things that you can look at, including charts and other things about our assessment, about you know what we picked versus what we didn't pick, and should we reconsider those types of things. Now, ultimately, you know, reporting and dashboards are key. I've shown you a lot of live views in here today, uh, but we talked about just you know data analysis and decision support. You know, in this portfolio level, for example. We have reports that uh, leverage Microsoft Power BI, but uh, a full data feed that supports all the data that's in one plan. So for example, at the multi-portfolio level, I see all the different portfolios that I have here. I could actually just focus on a particular portfolio here if I wanted to, right? Um, I could drill into a particular portfolio, like go to the portfolio details. And I could come in here and say, all right, in this in this portfolio, data analytics transformation, here's the uh, overall status. Here is the, uh, and if I want to drill in further, to be quite honest, I could drill into that particular program because this is program level data we're looking at now in that in that in that portfolio. And now I've got so this is giving me drill down data to whatever level of data makes sense for me to go. For example, we can have a health summary if that gives us a mirror of those KPIs I showed in the active views. You know, we could look at overall uh, financial health across all of our projects. We can look at things like overall risk summaries that pull things up, you know, risks across all projects and be able to slice into those. We can even look at things like insights, right? And basically say, you know, give me an idea where, uh, what projects we have that are off track on overall health and it would focus me you know, on those particular projects uh, as I drill through all this type of information, right? And then all kinds of trending like we talked about. We saw the trends in the live views, but what if we wanted to see trends on the various health states or on the details, right, of the projects and even on, you know, the work trends on uh, how we're doing on late tasks and other types of things. Once again, users who aren't hands-on within one plan can actually go directly into Power BI and view these reports uh, based upon the good work that you're doing within one plan itself. Okay, so a little high overview demo of the types of things that you can do with one plan, bringing different data points together uh, from a variety of sources, leveraging AI, and then leveraging the power of data and analytics and resource planning. So sample use cases for AI and portfolio management within one plan, all these uh, are available to us. We don't have time to go through this today in view, but for example, you could ask it to you know, generate a list of OKRs for your department. You could ask uh, Sophia to uh, uh, analyze patterns and potential risks in your strategic plan. You can actually ask it to help uh, optimize your portfolio and give you analysis of the portfolio, which we showed you a little bit, right, uh, within the live demo. We can also do work management whereby we can actually have it write a business case for us based upon the data that we've provided so far. We can ask it for it to build a project schedule. Like I said, that templating feature, we can ask it to build a project schedule for us and use it as a basis without us starting from scratch. We can ask it to identify risks based upon the type and the nature of the project and give us some risks to monitor based upon what typically are risky in, in the project of this type. Uh, capacity plan, we can actually have it build a resource plan for us for a particular project and that we can modify, but it gives us a starting point. Understand where we have shortfalls and where we need to hire. So the idea, the financial analysis we can do, okay? Uh, help me write communications like we talked about, a uh, status report or a project summary to your, to your email, uh, to your manager you can, that you can send an email. 
So once again, all these different things are available to us right from within one plan. So in summary, hopefully you saw all the things that we set out in the um, in the um, in the abstract and in the invitation for the for the webinar. The key is we can, we need to ensure that organizations are working on the right things aligned with the strategies and important uh, uh, priorities of the organization. That integration is re is important to get a comprehensive view of things. It also keeps users working in their preferred tools and solutions for the role, maturity, and type of work that they do. We support a variety of execution methodologies. We minimize duplication because we allow to just one source for that data and we provide comprehensive resource planning and tracking and data-driven insights. The key here with the AI is that we can then analyze it more comprehensively and better. We do this on an ongoing basis. Microsoft has awarded us five consecutive years for our uh, leadership in uh, as a partner in project portfolio management. We're also recognized similarly by the Gartner Group and by Forrester and Infotech Research. We also offer free trials. And that strategic portfolio management template is what I recommend if you want to basically get the full uh, experience. And we're happy to chaperone you through that trial and give you complimentary assistance so you get the most value out of your trial. You don't have to do it alone. So try a trial. We're happy to have a workshop with you uh, at no charge to understand where you're at and what it might take to get you into a solution like this. Just reach out to us at contact at oneplan.ai and we're happy to uh, get you to the right person that can handle you for the types of questions that you have. Or just research us some more at www.oneplan.ai. So thank you for your time today. Uh, we leveraged just about the full hour today. One Plan is a hub that brings all these things together, you know, different tools, different methodologies. Uh, reporting, resource planning, and all the different dimensions of project and portfolio management. Uh, we call it the power of one. We really do hope to engage with you. If you got some value out of this, don't be shy. Reach out to us and let us know how we can help. Thanks again and have a great day.